Okay, I think we have, is it a song next? Oh no, we're going to get right into the message. Okay, I know what time it is, and if I practice my teacher skills, at 10 o'clock the bell's going to ring. Oops, excuse me, 11 o'clock the bell's going to ring. So, and I know I got 20 minutes of Pastor Dave, but I want to launch you into what some of our worship is. And we're going to talk about the church. And last week, Dave started a series in the nature of the church today. And he talked about um, how we're going to be more about the body of Christ. And as we're sitting here, I'm going to go through some signs. I know there's a pew Bible in front of you if you want to open that up. Um, we're going to be in Acts 2. Um, I think it's in verses 4 in the 40s. Ken, can you give me the next slide? And so what we're going to talk about today is what the Methodist churches in Minnesota and the Dakotas are talking about. This just isn't what Holly Tabber came up with or, oh, that Pastor Dave Brown, what was he thinking when he came up with this series? This is about the, the Methodist church in Minnesota. And, and, and the um, introduction of like when Jake and, and Pastor Dave were at that conference. Next slide, Kevin. And so Bishop Orr, who oversees all the Methodist churches in um, Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota, and he is the president bishop of all the bishops, bishops in the United States. So he has a tremendous amount of responsibility. And he reminded in his address at conference that Jesus had three missional imperatives. His three values was to love God and love your neighbor. It was to reach new people, and it was all about healing a broken world, whether it is through um, physically and or just the peace of getting along. And in that, us as Methodists, Methodists mean there's a method to what we do, from John Wesley, our mission statement is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's, that's what we get to do. Next slide, Kim. And so, in developing a plan for the Methodist Church, and even for our Mount Bethel Church, and as our DS, um, Reverend Cynthia Williams said, um, when she was here for our um, meeting, on the 28th, just last week, she, she recognizes Denver Grove Heights is a rich missional field. And I think that is almost a quote of what she said. And so she recognizes, just as we do too, that, that we live in a good place and we worship in a good place. But we can also do better. We can continue practice in our therapy. And so sometimes when, when in instruction and in my teaching mode, and these, and people go like, oh, this is what we're going to, you know, this is the thing. I just want you to know that there's a big picture of it. And Bishop Orr and his message presented between now, 2017, and 2020. Oh my gosh, I thought never in my life when I graduated from high school, I'd even say 2020. But we will probably be here in 2020. And this is what the church is planning in Minnesota and the Dakotas is for building and transforming the world for Jesus Christ. Right now we're talking about Acts 2 and just encountering the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? We're going to go next year, we're going to talk about joy and getting living deeply in joy. And what I love about the word joy is, joy is deeper than happiness. You can be happy, but joy goes down to the soul. We're going to talk about reaching and daring to be disciples. And we're going to talk about healing and being the light of the world. When we talk about our church today, we're not talking about, oh, right now in July. We've got a broad plan. There's a broad therapy for this. There's a broad purpose and best practice. So hopefully, when I say we have time, sometimes when we think we have time, that will kind of relieve some of the anxiety that we might hear. Talk about like, holy buckets, you want me to, you want me to think about this? We have time. Next slide, Ken. Um, Bishop Moore, when his presentage presented to the um, conference, and um, so I feel a little stronger in being a credible resource, he talked about from the, um, the Bible translation of the message and the prerequisite of the author of the message is Eugene Peterson. And his introduction to 
the book of Acts is the story of Jesus does not end with Jesus. It continues in the lives of those who believe in him today. We are continuing that story. The supernatural does not stop with Jesus. Luke, the author of Acts, makes it clear that these Christians he wrote about were no more spectators of Jesus than Jesus was a spectator of God. They were in on the action of God. God acting in them, living in them, which also means, of course, God in us. Next slide, Kat. Okay, so we're, what we're going to do today is we'll worship a little bit different. Pastor Dave has his message, and it's 20 minutes long. Okay, and he won't even go up. 20 minutes, we're done. But, but to launch you into that, I want to give you two things to think about as we go into Pastor Dave's message. And one, I want to go into whether you want to get the scripture out in front of you, or I'm going to read it through here. We're going to read from Acts 2, and um, the key verse is the very first one that, that Pastor Dave is going to talk about. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. Oh my gosh, just like us. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Next slide, Kim. Okay, we are going to watch Pastor Dave's message. And this is what I do when I'm teaching kids at school. When, when, when I say that we're going to put something, a video into it, I'm going to give you what are you going to look for? Or what should you listen for? And if you look at the front of your bulletin, there's two visuals there. Church in rows, and kind of church around the table. That's going to be one of the concepts that Dave is going to talk about. I think it's something that we do practice here at Mount Bethel. Just a thought. But our guiding questions as we listen to Dave's message is, one, as you're listening to it, what do you notice? And, and why do you think that? Can you tell me more? And what are our next steps? Now, this is what I know about learning and when we present things. We're not going to have the answers right now. I think what we're going to take in here today, we're going we're gonna to chew on. And we might have the tomorrow or when we wake up, oh, now I know what I want to say. Great. Say it to someone. Talk it out loud. Think through that. We don't have all the answers today. Learning is a process and, and it takes time. And that's why God gave us this Bible to take time and process through it. So Ken, if you would hit that, click here. And he's going to turn Pastor Dave on and up. And we got um, 20 minutes of Pastor Dave. And then we'll just come together in some conclusion or some responses. And Ken, we're going to put the sound on. Bergen. Okay. And then... Alright. I was surprised to learn that the history of Christian missionaries in China goes back to 781 A.D. Did anybody know that? 781 A.D. There were missionaries in China. When Mao Zedong and the Communist Party took control of China in 1949, it is estimated that there were four million Christians. In that nation. Missionaries were expelled. By 1966, churches in China were closed as part of the Cultural Revolution. China had become isolated from the rest of the world. And Christians in this country and other nations wondered what happened to the body of Christ. What happened to our brothers and sisters in China? Under that repressive communist regime, regime, most thought that there was no way, no way 
that the church can survive. In 1972, the doors to China creaked open as more and more Americans and uh, people from other nations went to China and visited China, an amazing discovery was made. The body of Christ was not crushed. The body of Christ was not destroyed. The body of Christ was not absent. In fact, the body of Christ was thriving. The body of Christ was alive. With no, get this, with no advertising, no buildings, no publishing houses, no formal committees or programs, no or, or with leaders who were imprisoned and martyred. Chinese Christians gathered together in homes by the power of the Holy Spirit to study the scriptures, to hang on to the faith that they had learned from their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, to encourage one another to follow Jesus in nearly impossible conditions, to break bread together and to pray. This underground house church movement not only grew, but thrived. So that today, there are nearly 6 million, 67 million Christians in China. Over 70 years, this is an exponential growth of doubling four times Jesus followers from 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to 67 million Christians. The Holy Spirit has been working in China. I believe the body of Christ in China lived out the Acts 2, what I call the Acts 2 method of following Jesus. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to pray. A few years ago, I heard a speaker say, every congregation should be a church planting congregation and every Christian a church planting Christian. Because I was a church planter at the time and it was a church planting conference, I jumped on board with that and I thought that was great. But after seven years of planting house churches, I discovered that this saying should be changed a little bit. It should say, in my opinion, every congregation is a disciple-making congregation or church, and every Christian is a disciple-making Christian. We need to make disciples. This is the mission statement of the annual conference, making disciples for the transformation of the world. Jesus said, go make disciples. Disciples, not go start. All of us know, however, that there is a fundamental problem in our life together. There's a fundamental problem in disciple making. And the fact of the matter is, in most congregations, it's not happening. Disciple making isn't happening. We've spent a few days talking about making disciples, and most of us know that we have failed at it, and maybe we've failed so often that we've given up. At the root of the problem, I think, is thinking that worship is enough to make disciples. We have equated church with worship, and worship with being a disciple of Jesus. This is not a new or a unique problem to United and only to United Methodists. In 2008, one of the fastest growing largest congregations in the country, Willow Creek Community Church, discovered that they weren't growing disciples. They had great worship, people were getting saved, and, and hundreds and if not thousands of people were gathering together in various kinds of small groups. But they also discovered that many people, by the hundreds, 
were leaving the church and looking for places where they could grow in their faith, where they could learn to practice and follow Jesus better. Willow Creek sponsored a church-wide study called Reveal, and uh, it showed that in our day, as they shared it with a greater, the greater Christian community, churches of all sizes, all denominations have the same problem. They discovered that worship alone, focused on worship, does not make disciples. In the 1700s, John Wesley was preaching in Bristol, England. He saw that the Anglican church was not making disciples. They were hardly leading people to Jesus. So after he preached out in the coal mines and in the parks and in the cemeteries, he gathered those new Christians together in small classes. He gathered them together in a little bit larger bands and societies that met weekly, and they kept each other accountable to following Jesus. They read the scriptures. They prayed together. They broke bread with one another. And they went deep in their relationships in order to flee from the wrath to come. Wesley encouraged them to continue worship in their Anglican buildings, to participate in the sacraments. But he knew that wasn't enough. He knew that worship alone does not make disciples. Going back a little bit further in history, let's say 2,800 years ago, God himself recognized that his established pattern of worship, of offering tithes and sacrificing animals in an elaborate cultic system of temple, of building, and priests, clergy, was not working. The prophet Micah is representative of the words of many in the Old Testament. Cullen just quoted him. With what shall I come before the Lord? With burnt offerings, with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil, with my firstborn? No. What does the Lord require? But to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. The sacrifices, the tithes, did not make disciples. You see, disciple-making isn't happening in our congregations because we've equated church with worship with, with disciples of Jesus. Acts 2.42 gives us a different picture. The original vision of what church is and what disciple-making can be. The early disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. I think the Acts 2 church looks like this. Christians gathered around the table to share and to celebrate, to pray and to fellowship, to learn from each other and to grow together. It is this church that uh, goes then to their families. It's this church that goes to their workplace, to the neighborhood, and to live out what they've learned around the table. This church is relational. This church is intimate. This church is conversational. This church is made up of family and friends. This church has deep, deep fellowship and communion with each other. I think these things are the traits of the, or the seedbed for discipleship. So that when Christians come together, they can truly share their lives, they can share their experiences, they can share their collective wisdom, they can share their learning, their joys, their burdens, their struggles, their questions. And when that's happening around the table, it's so much easier to invite a friend to invite a neighbor, to invite a co-worker to come and say, sit at the table with us and learn and grow in the ways of Jesus. In 2010, I was appointed to plant uh, Acts 242 house churches in the Twin Cities. And um, ex I experienced that seedbed of community 
in great mighty ways. We planted nine churches over the course of three years. Guess what? A lot of them failed. For various reasons, they failed. I wouldn't say they failed because we made disciples and we grew together. But what I discovered is that disciple making isn't easy. It's not easy. I don't think I've heard that this week. Disciple making is not an easy task. And people, um, you know, decided they didn't like this intimate communion. People preferred Sunday morning worship. That's okay. But we did keep three churches going. Last year we lost one. We we're down to two. The life of one of those two is questionable at this point in time. Failure, failure, failure. Colin said fail nine times for that one success. We planted nine churches. I think by the end of the year, there's going to be one in existence. But that church is awesome. There are 14 people that are gathered around the table every Friday night for two and a half hours. We have a meal together. We eat together. And then we go into our sharing time. We developed a, a 11 things that we have to share about. We choose one or two. A life celebration, a joy, a burden to bear, something that we learned, a spiritual insight, a God moment, a scripture insight from daily devotions, a personal struggle. Yes, we even have confession of sin on our list. And I'll tell you, it happens. A new conviction, an application of scripture, an opportunity that we had in the last week to serve or to be served. And the people gathered around the table will share their excitement and their joy and their pain and their suffering at the table. And after we share, we pray for one another. Just last Friday, uh, we heard testimony of three, three of our 14 people that went into the sandstone prison as part of the Karis ministry and worshipped with the, with the inmates there. We had one person that has been working with Washington County Social Services as a volunteer to help move a woman who had to go to a nursing home. And her house was filled with stuff. We cleaned up, uh, we threw away one dumpster full and had not one garage sale, not two garage sales, but three garage sales. And we did that as volunteers because the social worker in Washington County is overwhelmed. And she knows that we have a church person who is willing to help and serve. Another one of our members works for Habitat Humanity. He's a director in Red Wing. And he shared about 19 students that came from Illinois and worked hard all week long on a Habitat project in Cannon Falls. And he was able to be with them and lead them and teach them and train them and share his faith. You see, we have disciples that are growing together around the table, called believers, children of God, who are serving in social services, serving in habitat, serving in the prisons, serving their neighbors. It's amazing. Every week we have testimonies about God's goodness and God's grace. That church started with two people praying for more seven years ago. We went from two to four. We went from four to eight. We went from eight to 14. Exponential growth. Not great numbers, but exponential growth. Compare the results of an Acts 2 and 4 style church with our own current reality. We see a dramatic difference. The Acts 2 church, people were added daily. Today, we experience decline. At Acts 2 Church, no one had any need. There was favor with all the people. They were one in heart and mind. They turned the world upside down. But we see decline. We see a scarcity mentality. We see the church being irrelevant. We see us divided over many issues. We see low or no impact on the community. I'm speaking in general terms, you know. With these things in mind, 
Our annual conference has also a vision that, re that re reflects marks of discipleship to grow in love of God and, to, uh, and neighbor, to reach new people in Christ, to heal a broken world. My experience has been that um, the congregation in the Acts 2 worship does discipleship better than the traditional mindset of worship is enough. I've heard people define church when I ask the question, tell me about church. I've heard people say, church is one hour on Sunday and throwing something in the collection. <laughs> Many of us have experienced the Acts 2 church I'm talking about, where personal relationships are enhanced and strengthened, where friends and neighbors are invited to a home for meal, for a meal and life sharing, where we do mission together as the body of Christ in our communities and workplace, where we use our gifts and talents. I think the Alden Church video that we saw yesterday, seven or eight people gathered together, looked like a house church to me. We have covenant group opportunities, you know, that uh, Steve Mansgar um, sells, and it's church, really, it's church. In one of the recent communications from the annual conference, we learned of the Redwood Falls United Methodist Church, who set a goal of developing a small group ministry in their congregation. 85 people tried it. Guess what they discovered? It's great. And now the goal is set higher. 150 people to be the church. This is where discipleship happens. Disciples make disciples. Gathered around that table. What we need to know, what we need to know is that every Bible study, every renewal group, Every prayer gathering, listen, is church. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of you. That's church. Amen? So look. Look. We've got all these tables. We've got all these tables. You guys have been thinking all week long that we're one big church, that this is church. you got this great worship. No. Your church right there. Your church right at your table. And wherever you gather with other believers, you are church. And guess what? The time we spend on Sunday morning in worship is a very small part of that discipleship. But when you gather together, when you gather together at the table with your friends, with scripture in hand, and read and apply God's word, and share the bread and the cup, acknowledging the presence of Jesus, with your hands open, praying for one another, and blessing one another, and sharing deeply from your lives, authentic community happens and grows disciples and is attractive to the outside world. The church as we know it and call it may be good for worship, but if we want to make disciples, if we want to turn the world upside down, if we want to grow hundreds of fold like our Chinese brothers and sisters in Christ, we must find a place to share at the table and become a disciple, make a disciple, and follow Jesus together. Amen. <laughs>
What do I got to think about? Uh, Judy's viewed this message a time or two, so she's had, she's had some time to rest in it, and so she's had some thoughts that she's put together, and we just like to share with Judy. And I think of coming here Sunday mornings, I think of this as going to church. But church is so much more than gathering here in this building. Gathering together around a table, such as the church two group, is also a church. Jake, you'll probably be having church every night this week when you gather together with other volunteers in the evenings and sharing. It is where we build relationships with each other. We share our faith and we grow together in relationship with Christ. In Matthew, Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples. How do we do that? One way is by not being afraid to talk to others about our faith and inviting them to share fellowship with us. Whether it's in a formal setting such as here, or an informal setting around a table, or coming together during a mission trip in the evening with other volunteers. I pray that we can all feel the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us to be disciples and to build relationships with others, making disciples by leading them to Jesus. I was very surprised to see uh, statistics on the Chinese uh, Christianity because I was there last year with my sister-in-law and their family is Christian but I met a lady who had struggled with being able to not be found out by going to home churches. Some of them are still struggling with that. So it was just delightful and I can't wait to talk to my family, my uh, sister-in-law and my brother who they go to the uh, the Shepherd Church right now, but they've all been, they're all Christian, and I just can't wait to discuss this with her about all those early statistics. Thank you. Does anybody else want to make a comment or have an immediate reflection? Um, can you go to the next slide? Okay. Um, two things. One of my thoughts is for me personally, as I was. Um, uh, listening to Dave's conversation about what church is, and being around the table, but also as we sit here in these rows. And my observation is, I think we at Mount Bethel do a little bit of each, but sometimes it happens just on Sunday morning. Because I hear from you the power and the importance of quote-unquote fellowship time, and how that is. And so in our community of church, Sometimes we just need to grab another, if it's crowded, we need to grab another table. We need to make more tables. We need to be welcoming. Sometimes we do church, our past experiences, we've done church so condensed that it needs to be in that fellowship hall. We need to spread out in this facility and that we have choices and opportunity to do it. And we have a really unique experience because we can practice doing church with other churches, which is pretty interesting. So those were some of my takeaways. And um, uh, on doing church and making discipleship, and just thinking about what is it like to make discipleship. Is there a, is there an open chair at your table to invite someone into community? Whether you're here with friends or you're out in the workplace with others. Um, uh, at conference, Bishop Orr gave these reaching out questions and talking about discipleship. And the church, and what is it? Is the church the building? Is the church this relationship with the people that we have? And he was one like, well, are you ready for Pentecost to come to the congregation? Because I'm sorry, it's going to look different. Are you praying for disciple making? Or are we praying for disciple making? Do you, do we want to be an Acts 2 congregation because I think it might look a little different. Do you want to be filled with the fullness of God? And I'm sorry, I totally believe being filled with God is a pretty scary thing in that. But are you open to it? And do you want the power of the risen Christ to work at with you? So just some closing thoughts with that. 
They can give a whole lot to be digested. What's really cool about this is I think this is all good conversation as we talk about church with one another. And in moving through with getting done, I think there's a song is, let's go to offering. Okay? We're going to have Clyde come up. We're going to do a little offering. And, um, and as Clyde's getting ready for offering, this is very special music because um, Clyde said, yep, I can do it. When he got the phone call this morning, it was like, we didn't have any power. And so it was like, Clyde, can you come help us? Clyde stepped forward. And um, nothing has been rehearsed other than driving in the car with Clyde. And so we're all in our roles. We're going to just go along with the goodness and the worship and the discipleship. And thank you, Judy and Clyde, for sharing. Yeah, I did get a call that they were waiting for the power to come on. And I think a lot of you have probably been waiting for a lot of things in your lives. It was probably what you were saying earlier. We all need more time. So this is a story that might apply to your lives. And I thank Judy for being so brave to uh, help me tell the story if we haven't rehearsed this at all. So we will see if you can get a message of this for yourself. <clears throat> Here the labor is so hard, the workers are so tired, and our weary hearts are yearning for a rest. And we find we're getting anxious to be in that happy land, where we'll receive such peace and happiness. But wait a little longer, please Jesus. Uh... 